So uh, let's see, in order to uh, motivate my presentation, I would like to uh, show you um, 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 some, some more picture of uh, vortex rings. I mean, there have been uh, some uh, beautiful pictures of vortex rings already shown, but I would like to show you some more. And there's actually a, a video on uh, YouTube I would like to uh, uh, show you. So let me uh, reconfigure my screen. So uh, here is a device called a vortex ring, sorry, a vortex gun. Not that I uh, condone uh, such bellicose uh, applications of vortex dynamics, but it's remarkable what kind of behavior we uh, see. So this is a vortex ring uh, shot by the, by the vortex gun. And as I said, it's, it's remarkable how, uh, how uh, stable uh, the, uh, the vortex rings uh, are. So uh, this uh, short movie shows us a, uh, a motivation for, uh, for my talk because uh, one of the main goals um, that I would like to address in my, presentations, uh, my presentation is uh, uh, questions concerning uh, stability of, um, of um, uh, uh, vortex, uh, vortex rings. So um, uh, I will focus on inviscid vortex rings, which are sort of mathematical abstractions of the uh, real vortex ring, ring that we uh, saw just, just a moment ago. And in fact, um, I'm going to consider uh, finite core regularization. So I'm not going to talk that much about uh, vortex filaments, but rather about their regularizations um, producing uh, finite core um, vortex rings. So in terms of uh, the classification that uh, Pierre Germain um, introduced at the, at the beginning of the workshop, I'm going to follow uh, what he labeled, I think, as root number one. I should also say at this point uh, that uh, maybe I'll move on to um, um, so what, what I should also say at this point is that uh, this, this talk will be uh, slightly different from most of the talks that, that um, we've seen in this workshop in the sense that uh, in addition to applied analysis, I'll also uh, um, focus on, on uh, numerical analysis and, and, and computation. So there will be a lot of computations. However, I have to emphasize that uh, the, the problems that I'm interested in here are quite subtle and as such, they are not really amenable to uh, to a solution using uh, standard brute force numerical methods. So a lot of the presentation will be uh, um, uh, about using methods of applied analysis and, and also differential geometry to design um, 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 uh, uh, special numerical methods that, that will allow us to uh, answer questions concerning those kind of uh, problems. So uh, um, my experience is that uh, Zoom uh, Talks tend to be kind of kind of dry, so I would like to encourage uh, um, um, participants uh, to ask any questions via chat. I'll try to monitor chat as I uh, as I go on. All right. So uh, here is uh, okay. So um, since we are going to focus on the finite area uh, vortex rings, uh, those are examples of uh, a free boundary problem. So what distinguishes a free boundary problem from 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 other problems is that. Uh, the, uh, the shape of the domain on which differential equations are defined is a priori unknown. It has to be found as a part of the solution of the, uh, of the problem. And here we have uh, some solutions, some examples of free boundary problems. In 2D, we have the uh, um, vortex patches. So we have a family of uh, vortex patches. These are the uh, blue shapes, the singularizing um, a, um, a pair of, uh, of point vortices. And there is also a, um, a fed vortex ring in, in, uh, in, in 3D. So as it happens, whenever we want to compute such solutions numerically, or we want to study their stability, or we want to study the existence of nearby solutions, we have to linearize our governing equations around the equilibrium shapes. So uh, since uh, um, uh, the equilibrium solutions are given in terms of equilibrium shapes, it means that we have to, in some sense, uh, linearize with respect to shape. Okay. So what does this exactly mean? Well, I'll, I'll make this uh, question um, precise uh, shortly, but um, uh, this implies that uh, in order to be able to study those kind of problems, we need uh, uh, a calculus of shapes, uh, the suite of mathematical tools that will allow us to efficiently uh, analyze and compute shapes, okay? So I guess uh, this calculus of shapes is going to be a recurrent theme of my, uh, of my presentation. So here is uh, here is um, 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 the plan of my presentation. First, I'll uh, focus on uh, the question of uh, computing uh, equilibria of uh, free boundary problems. And uh, I'll show you 
how uh, certain classical solutions in this field can be efficiently uh, computed using uh, uh, methods based on uh, shape differentiation or shape calculus. Then uh, I'll um, explain how those tools can be used to study uh, linear stability of inverted vertex rings. And uh, here we'll actually um, um, show some relatively new results, uh, which uh, have provided partial answers to some uh, long-standing open questions in, in theoretical hydrodynamics. And finally, time permitting, I'll also say something about uh, how those techniques uh, um, uh, help us um, uh, understand um, uh, when we can uh, continue uh, families of, 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 sol of equilibrium solutions with respect to our uh, parameters. Okay, so part one about the uh, computation of uh, relative equilibria in um, free boundary problems. So we are going to focus on uh, Euler equation in, uh, in uh, 2D or 3D axisymmetric um, um, geometry. So it's, it, it is well known that uh, time independent Euler equation uh, can be written as a nonlinear elliptic boundary value problem um, where the right hand side uh, f of psi, psi is a, a string function, where the right hand side the function is typically uh, discontinuous. Okay, where uh, in 2D, the uh, elliptic operator is just the uh, Laplacian, whereas in the through the axisymmetric uh, geometry, it has uh, this form, and this, which is oftentimes referred to as the, uh, as the Stokes operator. So, uh, um, um, uh, system, uh, this, this elliptic uh, system is a nonlinear boundary value problem. And uh, if, the, if the right hand side, the source function f, f of psi, is discontinuous, it actually uh, gives rise to a free boundary problem. Because um, uh, when the right hand side function has this uh, form given here, then uh, it represents uh, a, uh, a, a vertex region, which is um, um, uh, embedded in an otherwise uh, potential, potential flow. Okay. So uh, finding a, a relative equilibrium in a suitable moving frame of reference of a uh, free boundary problem like this typically boils down to determining the, uh, the shape of the boundary. The shape of the boundary, which separates the, uh, the uh, vertical region inside the, uh, the blue curves on the left, for example, from the, uh, from the potential flow. So typically, the equilibrium boundary is characterized by the uh, kinematic condition given here, which uh, basically says that the uh, normal velocity component has to vanish everywhere uh, on, the, um, on the boundary. Uh, so finding, f finding this uh, boundary is a uh, key, uh, uh, key problem, uh, key, is, is, is a key step in the, uh, in the problem, because once that boundary is found, then uh, finding the solutions uh, um, inside the, uh, the boundary and outside basically boils down to the um, uh, inverting uh, the operator L, which is typically quite, uh, quite straightforward. Um, so uh, in, in the kind of problems we are interested in, it's uh, convenient to uh, express the kinematic condition using uh, um, the uh, Biosabart kernel, which we use in the, uh, in the contour dynamics form. So this, this integral, which is defined on the, uh, on the boundary, basically gives us the, uh, the velocity times the normal vector. So here's our uh, kinematic, uh, kinematic condition. Now, in the, two kind of, in the two classes of problems that we are interested in, in the Biosava kernel, takes the following form. Um, uh, here is uh, its form in two dimensions. In two dimensions, we typically prefer uh, to work with uh, complex, complex variables. Whereas uh, in the 3D axisymmetric flows, it takes this rather complicated uh, um, uh, form uh, expressed in terms of uh, um, elliptic integrals um, of the first and second kind. The elliptic integrals arise here because of the uh, axisymmetry. So this, this, this kernel is basically obtained by uh, by integrating the standard Biosalva kernel in the um, um, azimuthal, uh, azimuthal uh, direction. So let me now uh, introduce uh, um, a family of vortex rings that, I, that uh, I'll, I'll focus on. So they are typically referred to as uh, Nurburi's vortex rings. They were uh, mentioned uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, they have been mentioned, mentioned already on a number of occasions in this workshop. They were uh, theoretically predicted by a Franco uh, and then by, by Benjamin using, using virtual arguments. But it was actually Norbury uh, who, uh, for the first time, computed them in uh, 1973. So as a first part of, the, um, um, uh, of my presentation, I'm going to show you how we can uh, efficiently and accurately 
um, um, recompute uh, those solutions um, um, using um, um, with, 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 very, with very high precision. This very high precision is, is really necessary here because we'll be interested in uh, in um, studying their stability, which is which is going to be the main part of uh, my presentation. So uh, Nurburi used the following uh, normalization, where in particular he introduced uh, a um, an equivalent the radius of the vertex ring, which is a parameter alpha defined such that the uh, area of the vertex ring in the meridional plane, by the way, what we are looking at here is the cross section of the vertex ring, which is axisymmetric in the meridional plane. Uh, then uh, the cross sectional uh, area is given uh, as um, uh, pi times uh, a square, even though obviously the, uh, the cross section need not be, uh, need not be uh, circular. And there are two important special cases. Uh, when a goes to zero, then obviously uh, uh, the uh, vortex ring uh, shrinks to a, uh, to a circular vortex filament. This is something that has received a lot of attention in this workshop. In the opposite extreme, when alpha goes to um, uh, the square root of two, um, we approach uh, what is called a uh, hill spherical vortex, which is actually, uh, I guess, one of the few known closed form solutions of 3D Euler equations. Okay, so how do we how do we find such such flows? Okay, so let's start with the uh, with an arbitrary closed uh, contour, which we'll call um, uh, um, delta a. If that contour is arbitrary, there is no reason for the kinematic condition on that contour to be uh, to be to be satisfied. So then we deform the boundary, and uh, we such that the uh, new deformed contour is parameterized as follows where the deformation is given by uh, some uh, suitably uh, um, sufficiently regular function uh, r, and uh, which deforms the contour everywhere in the normal direction, OK? So then uh, on the deform, we, we can require that the, or the, the deformed contour uh, satisfy the, uh, the kinematic condition, which gives rise to a uh, nonlinear sort of geometric equation defining the uh, the uh, the, um, uh, the equilibrium contour, where the unknown is the deformation r. So how do we how, how can we find this this deformation that gives us the equilibrium? Well, we can um, we can um, uh, apply Newton's method to this to this to this equation, where uh, well Newton's method normally proceeds by a sequence of linearizations, where at each step we have to compute the uh, the uh, the Jacobian. But here, since the uh, the state variable, if you like, is is is, is a shape, uh, our Jacobian has to be defined with respect to the uh, shape of 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 uh, of, uh, of the contour a, which means that it has to be computed by a suitably defined shape differentiation. Okay. So what does it mean to uh, um, uh, compute a shape um, shape Jacobian? Well, we proceed uh, as follows. So. Uh, we have our uh, perturbed uh, uh, kinematic condition, okay, which defines our, our function. And then uh, we uh, differentiate this perturbed kinematic condition with respect to epsilon, which basically uh, gives us a directional derivative in the direction of the perturbation r. Okay? And in order to evaluate this, uh, this um, um, derivative, well, we have to shape differentiate the uh, elements uh, marked in uh, red. So we have to differ shape differentiate the normal vector. We have to shape differentiate this integral with respect to the shape of the contour on which it is defined, but also with respect to the point where it is evaluated. Okay. So um, uh, let's 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 look uh, at how we can shape differentiate the uh, the uh, the integral. So let's let's consider uh, so in order to um, to address this question, we have to uh, um, uh, define what is called the, uh, the shape derivative. So let's, let's consider a contour integral uh, where we integrate, uh, which is defined for simplicity on the complex plane. Integration takes place with respect to zeta, and that is a, a parameter. Importantly, uh, that might also lie on the contour itself, and, uh, and um, uh, the function might have a singularity on the, on the contour. If we perturb the contour, well, then we have uh, another integral defined on the on the per perturbed contour, <clears throat> where the perturbation is is constructed exactly as I described on the uh, on the previous slide, and then uh, the uh, shape derivative is defined by taking uh, a difference of uh, the integrals defined on the perturbed and uh, unperturbed uh, contour, 
dividing this by, by epsilon and taking the, uh, the limit. And importantly, thus defined uh, uh, shape derivative is actually a linear operator acting on the uh, function R defining the, uh, the, uh, the perturbation. And this is actually something that will play this, 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 this fact uh, will play a, a major role in, in, uh, in, uh, in what, will, uh, what will follow. So shape calculus is, in, uh, is a suite of mathematical techniques that uh, was originated uh, in, in differential geometry, most, more specifically uh, calculus on manifolds, which basically gives us recipes how to compute uh, shape derivatives of various, various objects. So for example, a uh, shape derivative of, um, of a contour integral as defined here is given by this, by this formula where the top expression um, can be identified as corresponding to the uh, modification of the contour, whereas the bottom expression uh, corresponds to uh, perturbation of the point uh, where the, uh, the um, uh, expression is evaluated. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, the, uh, uh, the former expression the, uh, depends on the curvature on the, uh, on the contour. So basically, when we apply uh, the shape differentiation tools to our kinematic condition expressed in terms of the uh, Biosava kernel, we obtain this, uh, uh, we obtain the shape Jacobian given by this uh, singular integral differential um, operator, where we have a, uh, a number of singular kernels marked in, uh, marked in red. They're all singular. However, uh, um, uh, by analyzing those kernels, we can uh, uh, precisely determine the structure of singularity which is typically logarithmic with a well-known prefactor. And uh, this fact will actually have uh, foraging consequences for uh, the numerical approximation of that uh, singular integral, um, integ integral differential operator. Such that um, the, um, uh, our uh, continuous infinite dimensional Newton's method takes uh, this form. So, so this, 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 this equation actually defines a, uh, a single Newton step in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, um, uh, in uh, Newton's method, where Newton's step is, is the function r, and it can be computed by inverting the singular integral differential operator. And I should emphasize that uh, the singular integral differential operator is actually defined on the uh, on the uh, on the contour of the of our region. Okay, so we we have a singular integral differential equation defined uh, on the uh, on the boundary of the contour that has to be inverted. At every iteration, and this gives us our our um, Newton step. Uh, how well? So for most problems of practical interest, uh, this has to be done uh, done uh, done numerically. So uh, here is how we can uh, um, um, represent our solution. So uh, we are aiming for spectral accuracy here. So we represent the solution in terms of uh, uh, trigonometric interpolance. And then the key question is. Uh, how we can uh, approximate uh, the uh, singular integrals. So uh, we do this uh, using a well-known technique where uh, knowing the structure of the singularity, we actually add and subtract the singularity. So the part where the singularity has been subtracted, well, it's no longer, no longer singular. And actually uh, uh, this uh, expression in red is, is a well-defined function. So uh, uh, this is, this being a smooth function, the first integral can be evaluated uh, um, with spectral accuracy using just a Gaussian quadrature, which on a periodic domain just is a simple uh, trapezoidal quadrature, whereas the singular part is normally uh, uh, amenable to uh, analytical evaluation. Okay, such that um, after all of these steps, we obtain uh, a discrete system which can be solved uh, uh, without a uh, um, uh, major problem. So uh, here are the results. So basically, uh, these are the uh, vertex rings initially uh, discovered by, 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 by Norbury. However, here they are computed sort of with a 21st um, uh, numerical uh, machinery with, with a very high precision. So we see that uh, when uh, parameter alpha is very small, the uh, vertex uh, rings become nearly circular and they basically shrink to a uh, to a, um, um, to a, uh, to a filament. On the other hand, when, uh, when um, um, the parameter alpha goes to um, pi over to the square root of two, then uh, we um, approximate, we approach uh, uh, Hill's, Hill's vortex. Uh, on the right figure, we see the um, uh, Fourier coefficients uh, of uh, representing the, uh, the shapes. And we see that uh, 
in all cases they uh, they uh, decay uh, exponentially, except that uh, that exponential decay is, is is lost as we approach uh, the um, uh, Hill's vortex limit. Uh, and the reason is simply that the uh, the function describing the boundary is no longer uh, is no longer smooth as we approach the um, the, uh, uh, the the Hill's limit because of the uh, emergence of uh, of corner 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 singularities. But remarkably, we see that we 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 we, we the, 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 the Fourier coefficients are resolved basically down to numerical round affair. Um, okay, so. Uh, so this brings us to the second part, where we would like to ask questions about the uh, stability of um, uh, those kind of um, uh, vortex uh, vortex rings. So this work is uh, based on uh, uh, some papers that uh, um, already appeared. Um, some of them quite recently, as recently as as, uh, as a year ago. So uh, the, uh, the the study of stability of vortices has had a long history. Starting from the work of uh, Kelvin and, and, and Love, and uh, there are also some recent results by uh, Thierry Gallet and Didier Smith. Um, so, uh, uh, in most of those cases, uh, problems were uh, uh, studied using techniques that were specifically adapted to the uh, particular configuration. For example, by exploiting various uh, various symmetries. There were also uh, slightly more general methods based on uh, variational arguments. However, at least as far as uh, um, uh, free boundary problems in vortex dynamics uh, go, uh, there is no general sort of uh, operational uh, framework uh, available to study stability of such problems. Something that would resemble the uh, or Sommerfeld framework, uh, which is um, so useful in the study of uh, parallel shear flows. Such a such a general framework that would uh, uh, provide sort of uniform platform for studying stability of various. Uh, um, vortex flows is not quite developed. And one of the uh, sort of goals underlying this, this research program was to construct such an, op such an operator um, framework in, in the form of a suitable uh, uh, operator uh, that would allow us to study the uh, uh, stability of uh, Euler flows with, uh, with um, free boundaries. So here is, here is uh, how we propose to uh, develop um, um, such a framework. So a, a point of departure is the uh, Contour dynamics formulation of uh, two-dimensional vortex dynamics. So basically, when we uh, talk about uh, the um, uh, evolution of flows with discontinuous vorticity, uh, it can be very efficiently uh, uh, studied using the uh, contour dynamics equation, where we just follow the evolution of points on the boundary, uh, given uh, which is where the velocity is given by this integral, again defined on the on the boundary uh, only. So uh, we begin by uh, by finding some um, some equilibrium solutions, something we did uh, in the first part of my presentation, and then we linearize the evolution equation with respect to uh, those equilibrium shapes. So this again will need to be done using uh, methods of, of shape calculus. So assuming that the uh, black curve represents an equilibrium solution, we impose uh, a, a perturbation which is given by uh, the function uh, again by function uh, r. Uh, and, uh, and, and schematically indicated by the uh, by the red curve, uh, and then um, so uh, this gives us uh, the uh, perturb um, contour dynamics equation, which we then have to linearize around the equilibrium shape, uh, which means that uh, we have to shape differentiate the normal vector and the uh, the integral, and. Uh, <clears throat> Um, so uh, this can be done uh, using the uh, shape calculus techniques I introduced in my uh, in my uh, in the first part of my presentation, and uh, when you put everything uh, together, you obtain a linear uh, um, singular integral differential equation, uh, which defines the uh, which determines the linearized evolution of the perturbation uh, R. So this is basically uh, an equation that encodes information about how the um, uh, perturbation R. In the normal direction, evolves in the linearized uh, regime. Now, in those problems, perturbations may typically not be arbitrary because uh, they typically have to preserve certain uh, invariants. For example, in 2D, they have to preserve um, uh, area, which is equivalent to preserving uh, circulation. So, uh, constraints on, on uh, admissible perturbations can be derived by shape differentiating, shape differentiating the constraints. So, for example, 
considering the area constraint, its shape derivative takes uh, this form, which gives us a, 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 a constraint on admissible uh, perturbations. And then uh, assuming making a certain ansatz for the uh, time evolution of those perturbations, namely exponentially uh, in time, converts the, uh, the, um, uh, this, this uh, integral differential equation into an eigenvalue problem for the eigenvalues uh, lambda. And by, by, by solving this, you obtain a dispersion relation, which basically characterizes the uh, stability of the problem by giving us uh, complex valued uh, growth rates as function of the wave number of the, uh, of the perturbation. So uh, for, for uh, general equilibria in Euler flows, such as, for example, the uh, Nurburgris, Nurburgris vortex rings, that problem has to be solved numerically, and I'll come to that in a moment. However, in some special cases, um, those problems uh, can be uh, solved analytically. And this is something that I would like to uh, briefly revisit now, because it will serve as a validation of this more general uh, approach. So the, so the simplest case we can, we can, we can consider is the uh, two-dimensional uh, Rankine vortex, which is basically two-dimensional uh, columnar vortex. And uh, we are focusing on two-dimensional perturbations uh, only. So um, in this case, uh, the geometry of the problem simplifies uh, remarkably. The boundary of the vortex is just given by this very simple expression. A is the radius, curvature is just one over A. We have basically analytical expressions for all relevant quantities. When we stick this into our uh, integral differential equation, it simplifies quite a bit. Uh, it still features uh, a singular uh, integral, which can be uh, broken up into how many? Eight different integrals, all of which have, in fact, the same, the same structure and can be uh, evaluated using, using methods of, of complex analysis, such that uh, when you put all of these uh, regards uh, together in, back into this, this, this uh, perturbation equation, and then uh, use our ansatz for, uh, for the perturbation R, then what we obtain is precisely the dispersion relation discovered by uh, Kelvin in his original study of the stability of uh, Rankine's vortex, which uh, describes nothing else but the neutrally stable uh, Kelvin waves. So uh, we, here we obtained, uh, we, we recovered uh, Kelvin, Kelvin's original result as a special case of this rather general framework for studying the uh, stability of, of, of uh, um, um, uh, free boundary problems in, 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 in vortex dynamics. So there is uh, increasing the complexity of the problem a little bit. Here is uh, another similar problem, namely uh, Kirchhoff's uh, rotating ellipse, uh, which also admits a uh, um, closed form analytical solution. So uh, uh, the uh, stability of this the, the question of stability uh, of this equilibrium was addressed by, by Love in the 8th of the 19th century, who um, found uh, that, um, uh, who discovered that uh, as the uh, aspect ratio of the uh, ellipse increases, uh, there are uh, additional branches of unstable modes um, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which appear. And uh, we've been able to uh, recover precisely this result analytically again from, from, from um, um, our general framework, although it uh, did require some, uh, uh, some um, symbolic algebra uh, calculations. This serves as another, as another um, uh, validation of, of, our, of our approach. So uh, this example is also interesting because uh, in being non-trivial, it offers a very na nice test case for uh, validating our, our uh, numerical methods. Uh, maybe I'll uh, skip that. So. Uh, Again, uh, by, in, by approximating the uh, singular integrals, as I discussed earlier, by uh, um, adding and subtracting the uh, singularity um, of, 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 the, of the kernel, we've been able to achieve uh, spectral accuracy, which is represented in this plot, which shows the uh, error, the relative error in the uh, numerically computed eigenvalue with respect to the uh, exact um, uh, uh, eigenvalue as a function of the uh, wave number, as a, as a function of the uh, discretization n for, uh, for, uh, for different um, eigenvalues. And we clearly see uh, exponential convergence. So this shows that the, uh, because of the effort we put into uh, approximating the, uh, the uh, singular integrals, 
in this approach, we achieve spectral accuracy, which means that approximation errors essentially uh, decay uh, exponentially fast. We cannot really ask for, for, for more. OK, so I guess with this, we are armed to uh, tackle the uh, sort of main open question that we wanted to address in this, in this, in this uh, uh, work, namely the, the question of the uh, stability of uh, Norbury's, uh, Norbury's uh, vertex rings. So, uh, they are shown again here on the uh, on the left uh, plot, uh, where the uh, blue curves represents the uh, the uh, the boundaries of the uh, vertical region in the meridional plane. The limiting case uh, of fused vertex is shown on the right, and again uh, this is the uh, uh, kinematic relation defining the equilibrium, where k is the uh, the kernel given in terms of the uh, of our expressions, and the stability analysis will be performed by assuming that uh, uh, the perturbations have to preserve circulation, which means that uh, they have to be constructed such that this invariant is left um, un, uh, unchanged. So what, what, what do we know? Um, what do we know about uh, uh, the stability of, of uh, vortex rings? So only partial results uh, are, are known. There are some results obtained using uh, methods, asymptotic methods in the limit of A going to zero. So this is basically the, uh, the vortex filament limit. In particular, uh, there is the so-called uh, uh, the uh, more soft one instability, and there was another uh, uh, um, instability discovered by Hattori and Fukumoto. There were some results in the opposite limit, namely when alpha is, is equal to uh, square over two. Again, obtained uh, using uh, using um, um, uh, uh, perturbation techniques by by Moffat. And there were also some, some numerical results corresponding to nonlinear regimes. So these results are, were incomplete in the sense that uh, there, there were no results available for intermediate values of, of, of alpha. So vortex rings, which are neither very fat nor very thin. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, most of these results concerned uh, impulse response to a particular type of present, uh, perturbations. There are basically no results that would basically characterize the entire spectrum of the um, of the um, uh, of the uh, of the relevant operator. So this was the uh, the gap that we uh, intended to to fill. So um, in this particular problem, the perturbation equation uh, takes this this form. So uh, it is obtained by uh, shape differentiating the uh, kinematic condition um, with our Biosova kernel subject to the uh, a condition that um, the circulation uh, of the vortex be preserved. So the second equation here is basically a shape derivative of the circulation condition. And uh, uh, approximating, so basically this, this equation uh, is defined on the, uh, on the boundary of the, uh, of, the, um, of the different vortex rings, okay? Approximating uh, this equation with uh, um, uh, trigonometric interpolants, and uh, using our highly accurate uh, numerical, numerical technique to evaluate the similar integrals, we obtain a generalized eigenvalue problem. It is a generalized eigenvalue problem because the additional equation represents the, uh, the constraint. So let me show you some, um, some, uh, some results obtained in this, in this way. So when the vortex ring is relatively thin, so alpha is in, in this range, we obtain only uh, purely real eigenvalues. Uh, which corresponds to uh, um, to uh, neutrally uh, um, stable uh, neutrally stable mode, and we see that uh, as alpha increases, uh, those eigenvalues become uh, more and more densely packed on the real axis. Now, uh, the corresponding eigenvectors um, in uh, for thin vertices um, sort of resemble basically harmonics, which means that they are just Kelvin modes. Which makes perfect sense because uh, under the assumption of excess symmetry, uh, in the thin um, vortex limit, uh, the um, a, uh, vortex ring basically becomes as a, as a columnar vortex. So uh, the only relevant mode of instability is given by Kelvin waves. So this is what we uh, recover here. Interestingly, when the uh, parameter alpha increases and uh, um, um, crosses the critical value of approximately 0 0.925. There is a uh, conjugate pair of uh, complex eigenvalues with uh, no zero imaginary part appearing. There are actually two such families. And uh, interestingly, as alpha keeps increasing, 
the uh, imaginary, the uh, magnitude of the imaginary part is increasing um, as, uh, as well, uh, um, indicating the, uh, an increase of the uh, growth rate of linear length stable modes. Interestingly, uh, there is also a second family of uh, unstable eigenvectors. However, uh, that second family exists only for certain values of, um, of, uh, of alpha. Um, okay, so uh, let's take a look at the, the unstable uh, eigenvectors. So uh, here they are superimposed on the um, equilibrium shape of Norbert's vortex in the uh, Muriel plane. And uh, we see that as alpha increases, corresponding to uh, the uh, vortex ring approaching uh, Hill's limit, the uh, unstable modes are becoming uh, more and more localized near the uh, real stagnation point. You see they, they form a bulge near the real stagnation point. By the way, the, the, the vortex ring is moving to the left. So this, this point here represents the real stagnation point. And this is where the eigenvector, the unstable eigenvector seems to be uh, localized. Okay, so uh, let's now consider um, uh, the uh, companion problem of uh, stability of Hill's vortex. We um, solve this problem using a, an essentially uh, similar technique, except that uh, now our domain is not uh, uh, isomorphic to a unit circle. It is um, uh, mapped to a, uh, to, a, to a half circle. Our perturbation has a certain reflection symmetry, and uh, it's only represented in terms of um, um, uh, even, uh, and because of that, it's only represented in terms of um, even functions. And uh, interestingly, when we uh, study the, uh, when we solve the um, uh, stability problem in Hill's vortex, what we obtain is uh, uh, two pairs of purely imaginary eigenvalues corresponding to a linearly stable and unstable modes, complemented by what looks like a uh, continuous spectrum. Um, so. Computing a, new, a continuous spectrum numerically is a tricky business, but uh, we actually performed uh, a very careful uh, analysis of this. And, uh, and uh, um, uh, in particular, we saw that as we refine uh, the numerical resolution, the eigenvalues on the real axis fill the, uh, the, uh, the interval ever more densely, which is a sort of numerical manifestation of, 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 of a continuous spectrum. So um, uh, let's take a look at the eigenvectors. So, uh, sort of uh, anticipating what is, uh, so I should say that if you solve the uh, um, um, original problem, you get an approximation which doesn't converge. Uh, what it means is that uh, uh, the um, uh, spectral representation of the uh, spectral approximation of the eigenvectors does not really converge in the sense that the uh, Fourier coefficients do not, um, do not um, um, decay. Um, with, with the wave number, which is uh, an indication of that something interesting is, 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 um, is, is happening. So in order to address the issue, we uh, solved a family of regularized problem. So we basically uh, defined a uh, smoothed um, um, uh, eigenvector, uh, which is uh, introduced through a uh, basically Lopez filter defined in the, in, in, in the Fourier space. And then we solved a family of such problems in the limit of uh, vanishing regularization parameter delta. And uh, what we see on the left are the uh, Fourier spectra of the unstable eigenvectors corresponding to different values of delta. So uh, we see that the, uh, the spectrum is basically flat up to a certain uh, wave number k, uh, where we have decay because of the filter. And as the regularization parameter uh, goes to zero, uh, that, that uh, the transition point moves to the right. So basically in the limit, we obtain uh, a, uh, a, 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 a spectrum that does not really decay uh, in, uh, with wave numbers, indicating that uh, the um, uh, wave vectors are not actually uh, smooth functions. They are, they are distributions. They're, 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 they're something reminiscent of the Dirac delta function. And here is what the, they uh, look like uh, uh, for different regular, regularization parameters. We see that uh, as that regularization parameter goes to zero, they become more and more localized at the uh, near the uh, near the endpoint, and they, here they are shown shown again um, for different um, um, for different uh, uh, values of the uh, numerical resolution. Okay, so uh, let's see. I still have uh, five minutes, so I can briefly say a few words about uh, yet another problem where we are interested uh, in uh, in uh, the question of uh, under what conditions 
such equilibrium solutions can be continued with respect to uh, a parameter in a situation when they are constrained to satisfy the so-called kata condition. Um, so uh, the kata condition uh, is the condition requiring that uh, uh, the um, uh, flow separation should occur at the uh, at a certain point in the um, in the uh, in the flow domain. So this work was motivated by uh, another open question in classical classical hydrodynamics, which is known as which is sometimes referred to as the accretion hypothesis. So. Uh, if we have uh, a certain flow that has uh, that admits an equilibrium involving point vortices, uh, the question is: uh, Is this flow uh, also going to admit an equilibrium involving finite area vortex vortex regions? And the converse: If if a given problem does not uh, um, uh, does not admit a, uh, such an equilibrium for point vortices, is it also true that there will there won't be any equilibrium involving finite area of, uh, of vertices. Um, so this problem has actually uh, had an interesting history. Uh, so when you consider the simplest version, so basically flow past a flat plate, um, it was shown by, by Joukowsky that there is no point vortex equilibrium in this configuration involving flat plate that would satisfy the kata condition. Namely, that there would be a streamline Attaching to the uh, um, a separatory streamline attaching to the endpoint of the uh, of the um, of the uh, flat plate. So the reason I'm saying that this problem has had an interesting history is because there are actually textbooks in fluid mechanics, classical texts, which I um, I, I won't give you the titles, where solving this problem um, uh, um, was actually given as a homework assignment, and uh, and. Uh, but we know since the times of Joukowsky that uh, this problem does not actually admit a, uh, a solution. However, there were numerical computations uh, coming from uh, Russia in the 80s, from Goldschick's group and uh, from, from the UK, which actually uh, su suggested the existence of a finite area vortex region in that, in that configuration. So I guess the specific question that we, we would like to uh, address in this part um, is, uh, is a small sort of stepping stone towards addressing this, 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 this conjecture. Uh, and the question is as follows. If we have an equilibrium solution, depending on two parameters, say alpha zero and omega zero, under what conditions that solution can be continued with respect to the parameters? And the continued question is uh, what happens if we are also interested in uh, uh, solutions satisfying the, uh, the kappa condition. So if we uh, think of the solution in this uh, a parameter um, uh, space spanned by alpha and omega, we are interested in continuing either along uh, the horizontal axis, the vertical axis, or perhaps along the cutter line. Um, so how do we study this problem? Well, uh, we frame this uh, using the uh, uh, implicit function theorem uh, in, 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 uh, in a Banach space. So in our problem, uh, the main space was basically subolet space H10, whereas the the function in the uh, in the implicit functional theorem is basically uh, the weak form of the uh, of the uh, of the Euler equation. So uh, um, we proved uh, 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 two theorems. Um, the first theorem says that uh, such a continuation is possible as long as uh, uh, those conditions are satisfied on the vortex boundary. So um, um, th those conditions say that. Uh, the uh, the river that the uh, tangential velocity uh, that the velocity component tangential to the vortex boundary, which is given by the normal derivative of the stream function, must be uh, bounded from below and from above. So as long as the uh, velocity on the uh, on the boundary of the vortex is bounded from below and, and above, um, um, the uh, that equilibrium uh, configuration can be continued with respect to um, uh, parameters, which are omega zero and, and, uh, and alpha. Omega zero is the value of vorticity inside the, uh, the vortex region. Uh, and the second theorem basically says that um, um, uh, the same is true also under the, uh, the kappa condition. Um, the proof is very simple. We basically have to, in order to apply implicit function theorem, we have to demonstrate the uh, continuous invertibility of the Jacobian. And Jacobian in this problem, uh, because it's a free boundary problem, is obtained using methods of shape differentiation. And uh, its invertibility uh, is established uh, using Lux-Miriam lemma 
Gaussian standards, uh, standard estimates. So I'm afraid my time is uh, almost up, but I uh, have some uh, uh, numerical solutions illustrating how this works in, 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 uh, in practice. So uh, yeah, we computed flows where, which, which demonstrate that, uh, that, that, configure, that, that that type of continuation is indeed uh, possible in, in practice where uh, um, uh, those uh, flows represent the equilibrium solutions in, in a bounded domain. Um, uh, uh, some of which uh, satisfy the, the kata condition. Again, kata condition here uh, um, uh, consists in having a, a configuration where the separatrix streamline attaches tangentially to the uh, to this uh, to this uh, cusp uh, cusp point uh, here. Uh, okay, so I'm afraid that my time is up. Uh, I wouldn't like to infringe on the uh, time of the uh, time break. So uh, let me just um, um, show my uh, conclusions here. So uh, I guess the main uh, the main uh, theme of this of this uh, um, presentation was uh, how we can use uh, um, tools of simple tools of differential geometry, namely the shape calculus, to address some uh, some questions concerning the uh, existence, stability, and and uh, calculation of nearby solutions in some uh, classical problems in vortex dynamics involving uh, open rings, and uh, some new results uh, involve the. Uh, uh, stability of um, vertex, uh, Norbert's vertex rings um, uh, in uh, intermediate for intermediate values of the parameter alpha, and those results are only partial. I have to stress because uh, because uh, we restricted ourselves to axisymmetric perturbations only. Okay, so uh, I'll uh, stop at this point. Well, thank you very much for attention, and uh, my apologies for going over my time limit uh, by.